even if this wasn't like, oh, Putin ordered this one piece of info, go to the intelligence and then go to Smirnoff and then it ends up in Stefanik. Like, even if it isn't that, just like this, the contextual, the environment around this is that these guys, the Republicans on the Hill, are uncritically advancing material that like very well seems to be sourced from, from Russia in order to create problems. Hello and welcome to the Bullard Podcast. I'm Tim Miller. I'm here with my old friend, Washington correspondent for the New York Times, Glenn Thrush. We pulled you at the last second because I am obsessed with Alexander Smirnoff. And you have been you and reporting. Me both, buddy. You have been reporting on Alexander Smirnoff for the DOJ. But before we get to what I think is really the big story of the month, maybe the year, um, I want to do a little uh, memory lane with you, if that's okay. Uh, you sure. once hosted a podcast. I don't know if it's as successful as the one I'm currently hosting, but it's called Off Message. Yeah was at Politico, and you graciously had me on as a guest one time. And, uh, and you asked me a question that has, that has haunted my Google foo for the intervening eight years. And so I want to, I want to play that for the audience. Uh-oh. Let me ask you something. If Trump is the nominee and Hillary is indicted, one I think is more <laughs> probable than the next. Hillary would beat him from jail. That's the, okay. There we go. <laughs> Hillary would beat him from jail. Thank you. We just have our headline. <laughs> yeah. we, we can shut this thing down now. <laughs> We can shut this thing down now. And in more ways than once, my career uh, was one thing that we could shut down after that. Um, which how young and naive we were. How young and naive we were. You didn't seem to push back on me that much. You, that seemed about right to you, too. Did you we think were that? Holding, at that point in time, we were actually organizing panels to discuss the future of the whether or not the Republican Party could survive after Hillary's victory and Trump's defeat. Like we were, yeah. I'll never forget this. We were like, sort of like, as we were scheduling internal Politico panels and stuff, that was like what we were talking about. And then took that faith, fateful trip north on that windy November day, walked into the Javits Center in my hometown and uh <sighs> Here we are. We're still dealing with the aftershocks. Uh, yeah, it's quite the time capsule listening to that interview. We, we went on for about 45 minutes. We do some gay stuff, yeah. but we do. Most of the interview is like us analyzing the state of the Republican Party. Can the Republicans do well in midterms? You know, might it be possible that when Hillary's president, uh, you know, a Republican DLC will emerge? That was one topic we discussed. You know, maybe the Bill yes. Clinton, a, Repu- a moderate centrist Republican DLC maybe will emerge. So, um, you know, if wishes were ponies, you know? Well, yeah, we, we, we were not, somebody had not spiked our food with mushrooms or anything either. No, no, that was just but, what we thought. Um, but it really, it, I mean, it really did, it really did capture the vibe though, right? I mean, like, and I, th- I think people have, I mean, we've had so much Trump that we didn't realize that there, you know, there was... A real, I mean, where would we be? The, the question that I find really interesting, and I know we want to talk about the other stuff, is um, what what would have happened had Hillary won? Would we have eventually had to reckon with this phenomenon, whether Trump was leading it or someone else was leading it or not? Because the backlash was, as we now are very well aware, was building. So yeah. I think the uh, if you're looking at kind of counterfactuals on history, that's that's an interesting one. I don't know. I think the more interesting counterfactual is what would have happened if Marco would have won the primary, you know, because I think if Hillary, honestly, like I think Hillary beats Trump, we still, and we're still reckoning with some version of this. I, I don't, I don't yeah. think that like we're reckoning with the potential literal end of our democracy, but, but I, we're reckoning with this nationalist populist backlash that I think continues uh, and, and gains steam, frankly, after, after another Clinton establishment, Clinton presidency. But I, I do want, I, I don't, I think that a different, you know, we could have lived in a happier time, maybe not for some of our liberal listeners, but we could have listened, lived in a happier time where the autopsy candidate had emerged and and probably right, beaten right. Hillary, probably beaten Hillary because of Hillary's, all of Hillary's various weaknesses that cost her versus Trump. But anyway, um, we, we can maybe do two hours on that imaginary history. That's not the one we're in. Instead, we're in a real life spies like us novel where uh, the, a type of like, like 80s, us. it's like, it's like actually, but actually... The spies are even stupider than Dan Aykroyd and Chevy Chase, and the Republicans are even more pliable than than like a, a fiction writer of an '80s 
Soviet movie could have ever even imagined. And we have this fellow named Alexander Smirnov, as if the writers got bored with the name, who um, I, I want to kind of lay out what I kind of see happened, and then, and then I want to get through your reporting. Essentially, the Republicans are desperate for any piece of information to demonstrate that Joe Biden is crooked. Right. And they had determined that Burisma was the most likely example of this, this company in Ukraine that, that, that Hunter was on the board of. And, and going all the way back to the call from he- the perfect phone call with Zelensky, Republicans have been looking for something. And, and this FBI double agent emerges to, to give them exactly what they would dream of would be the case in a movie, right? Is that Joe Biden did get this money from Burisma and he has hid it in a series of secret bank accounts that you'd never be able to uncover and that he knows it because he worked with Burisma and they have their source and and the FBI kind of buys it. I want to hear your take on that. But the Republicans on the Hill buy it hook, line and sinker and, and essentially use it as a central element of this impeachment here uh, inquiry. And it turns out that not only is it a total lie, but it's probably seeded by the Russians. How is that summary for you of, of essentially what has happened here? I mean, that's good. What, what do you want from me? That seems to okay, have covered I, the entire I, war. For I want you to give us the, I want you to kind of get under the skin for, here, for well, us here. I don't, I, I, like, how did this come to pass? Who is this person? Well, he's not Yakov Smirnov, the 1980s uh, comedian, though he does apparently share some significant characteristics with him. Um, He is, we know very, very little about him. I I think that is by design. I don't know if he scrubbed his social media uh, prior to becoming infamous. I I can't find a picture of him. Have you seen a picture of him? Nope, nope. And he covered himself up uh, as he was walking out of the courthouse. I'm sure Russian intelligence has a picture of him. Um, There's one going on on the internet, but it's a guy that like, this guy's supposedly 43, right? And Smirnov, and this picture that people keep sending me, is like a person that looks like he's 60. So maybe it's think, spy I work think has aged this person poorly. There's a lot of, and there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of uh, Alexander Smirnovs, not surprisingly, in New right. York. I grew up in Brighton Beach, Brooklyn, which is the Ukrainian slash Russian enclave. And Smirnov was a really common name. Um, so, so he is somebody, you know, uh, he is somebody who occupied this kind of shadow lands world in the old Soviet states uh, of, of Eastern Europe and and, and around Russia, uh, of which uh, our intelligence services and our law enforcement services are having a, a need a lot of insight into. So I think the best way to kind of view this is to, to from the Goodfellas perspective, right? Okay. Um, when when the government wanted visibility, I, you know, I remember Sammy the Bull Gravano, who was John Gotti's associate, who flipped right, and I think he's a good he's a good guy to have in mind. Not that Smirnov know, knew as much or is as valuable, but back when they were trying to back when the feds were trying to crack the mafia, uh, because J Edgar Hoover after J Edgar Hoover pretended they didn't exist for like half a century, um, they enlisted a ton of confidential informants. A lot of them were killers. A lot of them were serial liars. But but so the challenge was when you have these confidential informants is to sift through the crap and to get to the information you can verify or leads that you can later pursue. So Smirnoff is, when you think of Smirnoff, Think of him as being somebody who's sort of a flawed narrator, and they know he's a flawed narrator. Frank Costello. We're going to update. We've done two 80s movies yeah. references, so let's update it a little bit. Let's do Frank to, to early 2000s. Got it. He's Frank Costello. So, right. So so you have a guy who is innately flawed. That's cool uh, in terms of internal FBI and law enforcement deliberations. You're not presenting that to a grand jury. You're not throwing him out his information out in public. Then what happens is somebody in the FBI, presumably somebody who's pretty pro-Trump, leaks this information, I believe, to Chuck Grassley, the senator from Iowa, uh, who then does a classic Hill thing, which is like, we need information. And and if if I'm not, so so just in terms of brief timeline, the story gets very twisted and complicated. But all all folks need to know is, uh, I believe Smirnoff tells his handler at the FBI uh, this information sometime in 2020. And it pertains to stuff that happened in 2015, 2016, 2017. Okay. Um, he, he makes up this story, according to the indictment, uh, that the Bidens were 
were each shaking, trying to shake down Burisma, this energy giant who was under investigation by the prosecutor general in Ukraine at the time for five million bucks each. OK, yep. um, they determined f- for various reasons right at the beginning that this is bullshit. OK, th- this is this is according to the indictments and also according to the detention memos that the feds uh, like back in 2020, the feds the, back in the, the 2020 feds knew immediately is bullshit. Essentially, they, or, or and that not not to go up the chain on this, that this yeah. didn't even warrant a second level of scrutiny. And there were various inconsistencies that uh, various inconsistencies in his story that were flags, and also, uh, like for example, that Hunter Biden's never been to Ukraine. Correct. Which, which other, just as a quick aside, does make it kind of weird that he was on the board of this company, having never been to Ukraine. But that's more of a Hunter Biden issue. <laughs> but anyway, but look, also but a big miss. This also the sidecar on this is like. Hunter Biden was engaged in activity that any reasonable outside observer would regard as being very, very questionable, right? Yeah, and sure. I think he's, he himself has said that. So his hands are not necessarily entirely clean as evidenced by the two indictments currently. Right. Against him. So, so, but, but this guy's claims don't check out. They're not verified by anybody else. And he's also uh, sending texts that say, I hate Joe Biden and I want to take him out, essentially. Right. So he's got a political motivation. Fast forward to 2023. Grassley gets wind of this, boom, puts out a press release, I believe in May of 23, that essentially says, brands, this is Biden bribery, and can we get to the bottom of this? Will the FBI release this form called a 1023, which is an, an informant report, right? Yeah. So over the next four or five months, this then becomes the snowballs, and it gets into the hands of, of James Comer. The head of the investigate, the head of the uh, uh, the government, uh, what is it? Oversight. The oversight committee, and Jim Jordan, and it just becomes kind of a a, a Fox Newsmax branded allegation, right? Never mind that it has been dismissed by members of the FBI. Never mind that they have gotten a briefing, according to Ken Buck, a, a Republican who sat in on the briefing. Uh, in which red flags were raised by the briefers about the veracity of this information. They just pumped it out into the public with apparently, uh, w- without the basic fact checking, uh, without the basic fact checking procedures that any community newspaper with three staffers would have applied to it, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, they didn't just pump it out. Let's pull up, uh, let's listen to how Elise Stefanik described this together. We're going to continue doing our work as House Republicans to bring transparency and Mm -hmm. ultimately accountability. This is the biggest political corruption scandal, not only in my lifetime, but I would say the past 100 years. You have multiple members of the Biden family profiting illegally uh, from foreign governments. You also have the bombshell reporting, including potential tapes that exist of while Joe Biden was vice president, taking a bribe from Burisma. So this reeks of corruption, and we are going to make sure that we follow the facts. And I want to say that Jamie Comer, who is our chair of oversight and government reform, he's been doing a tremendous job following the facts, following the bank accounts so that there can be transparency for the American people. She's going to follow the facts, Glenn. Well, we've followed the facts now. <laughs> Have we heard facts. from Elise today or in the last 24 hours? Have you guys heard from her about the, fa- the new facts? No, but what I would say is like one of the first things uh, um, a, a senior uh, Trump administration official told me when I was covering the White House in early 2017 is never, never admit that you've done anything wrong and never, never apologize. And, and that is really the playbook here. Comer and Jordan uh, have just said, look, this is what it turned out to be. We were misled by the FBI who said this guy was credible, was never a big, nothing to see here. Let's move on as quickly as we possibly can. Yeah, so. But- but I mean, this is yeah. crazy. Like the the extent of what so like what Elise was saying in that interview. I think it's just important to think about Elise's language because yeah. it wasn't like, oh, the FBI is looking into this. This could be the biggest scandal. Like she's like, this is the biggest scandal of my lifetime. Maybe the biggest scandal in one hundred years. And and she's specifically referring to the Smirnoff allegations, right? Like she says the word barisma. She says bribe. She talks about the taped phone calls that Smirnoff is, is bringing up that, that the FBI knew was untrue. So they, she takes this information that is just every single word she says is completely fabricated, right? By this one guy that doesn't like Joe Biden. 
Well, it, I mean, that's what the, you know, again, we're going to have to, I have to always retreat to that's what the prosecutors say, but they seem to right. have laid it out. And the other thing is the, is the lead, very importantly, neither Comer nor Grassley nor Jordan are disputing that this guy's stuff was fabricated at this point in time. Right. Yeah, just as a, just as a total aside, you know, you try to do the math on the hundred years thing. And uh, I guess Teapot Dome is some is in there, too. Teapot right? Dome before that. Right. Yeah. So, so, but, but, so I mean, which is like a d- yeah. direct bribery scandal. But I mean, yeah, so this exactly. is then this gets back to the smear off of it all. Right. Which is OK. Now, the question is, this guy is dealing with Russian intel. OK, he's a double agent essentially, right? right? Um, and and the pro- again, we can retreat to what the prosecutors say, but the prosecutors say that that some element of the information that he provided was planted by Russian intel, right? So it's not yes. a hu- it's not a huge jump here to say that like that he you, says that that he said well here's Smirnoff where it gets says that. right. This is where it gets. So I described him in the first story as a human hall of mirrors. Yeah. Okay, and I think that's that's apt. Obviously, it's because I wrote it. <laughs> but, I find my um, writing very apt. I find my <laughs> writing. It's, you know, it's like it was the best thing I thought. So but anyway, so he's super apt. So he, um, I mean, essentially, the problem is, and, and it's actually funny when you read the indictment. It's what makes it kind of like, like, really like seed corn for a great, a, a great HBO series, right? Is that they don't know. So he claims to have had stuff that was planted by Russian intelligence. Um, we have subsequently, through some of our reporting, determined that it was probably not the bribery allegation that he's referring to. It's probably the more recent intelligence. And for those of your listeners who are uninitiated, he had also more recently made the unverifiable claim that the Russians had bugged some hotel yeah. uh, and had compromised. Uh, on high ranking u s officials, potentially some people who might be involved in the presidential campaign, so we talk about the the um, the Republicans airing this as being uh, the catalyst for this indictment, but it 's also appropriate to say that another catalyst was and they say this directly in the indictment was that he was going to try to try to continue to intervene on behalf, they believed on behalf of Moscow to. Yeah. But I mean, and so, it's, yeah, so you're, we're, we're like now just kind of venturing into this hall of mirrors where it's hard to like draw a direct, right. you know, one-to-one, but like, but at least in that clip is talking about recordings and again, like in the same vein that she's talking about the hunter by the bribery with Burisma. And so, you know, it's not a huge jump to think that, that the, the record, it was the recordings that Smirnoff was, was had had sent on the dossier that she's referring to there, and that is apparently Russian intel disinfo. It, right? it, we don't know where it comes from. It's disinfo, clear clearly according yeah. to the indictment. The two things that I that that um, uh, pop into my head w- when I hear this stuff is, and I always in covering Congress, which I did for a number of years, I've always thought about this. If something is a st- would a statement be actionable in court? Would people be able to be sued if they said it without the protection of the speech and debate clause? Sure. Right. If you made this allegation against a private citizen in the way that Stefanik did, would that open her up to civil exposure had she not had this blanket? Right. And had she not been protected? Now, I'm not arguing that that she should be liable to sure. any of that stuff, but just as sort of like uh, 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 an ethical standard. Yeah. And and I don't think it surmounts. I think if you said something without evidence about a private one private person to another. And then the other thing that, you know, and again, I'm not this is an overworked comparison, but we have seen in, in years in, in years past legislators making essentially using taking the seed of an allegation that was leaked to them and spinning it and spinning it out that later turned to be turned out to be untrue. We had that experience in the 1950s yeah. um, and it destroyed a lot of people's lives. So, so, so I think, I think it is an entirely legitimate question to go back because these people, I do believe folks are trying to uh, erase the tape on this. And, and yeah. I think it is, a, it is a, an entirely useful exercise to go back and well, play and, precisely what it is. That they say. Yeah. And maybe more than, 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 useful needed when you think about the the broader context. And again, I don't want to, we're not getting over our skis here and being like, you know, I don't want to get into P tape, you know, territory here, but like there's some certain things we know, 
right? In 2016, we know that Russia interfered in the election, that they hacked emails, that they, you know, wanted to create chaos, that they wanted that they wanted to hurt Hillary. Um, we know that, that happened. We've seen Russia's actions in the intervening time, the, the invasion of Ukraine, um, the other, you know, counter countermeasures that they've undertaken. And, and we have this guy claiming that Russia was planting this info about about the Bidens right now in the heat of another of yet another campaign eight years later. And and even if like it wasn't one, you know, even if this wasn't like, oh, Putin ordered this one piece of info, go to the intelligence and then go to Smirnoff and then it ends up in Stefanik. Like, even if it isn't that, just like this, the contextual, the environment around this is that these guys, the Republicans on the Hill, are uncritically advancing material that like very well seems to be sourced from, from Russia in order to create problems. And like, there's, well, I, there's no reflection about that. There's no qualms about that. And frankly, they seem excited to do it. Well, the, well, the one thing I would say is, is, is we need to verify that that is in fact the case. And, and, and I will say just categorically, I don't think the Smirnoff, any of the documents filed in the Smirnoff case by the government indicate, uh, I, I don't think they, cl- they make that connection clearly. Now that might just be just sort of the circumspection of the prosecutor. You mean the, 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 the campaign interference? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I think this. I think the sense is more that this guy, you know. And the other thing about this is, it is, uh, I, it is highly unlikely that we'd be hearing about this had the Republicans not publicized this. This would have been just right. something that the investigators would have pocketed and said, because I'm, you know, from when you talk to current and former FBI people, they get all kinds of stuff push to them that that they just kind of throw out with the garbage. Right. So so the only thing that really brought this thing uh, brought this thing into the public light uh, was the fact that Republicans publicize this. This is from my sort from my sourcing in law enforcement. And then the other thing that's really that that might be that's lost again to, to people who aren't necessarily thinking uh, like law enforcement folks would. It is really highly unusual for the FBI to. Um, to enthusiastically burn somebody who'd been on their payroll in public, like, um, uh, uh, but 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 you know, and and the other, you know, the House Republicans went after uh, FBI Director Christopher Ray pretty uh, directly on this by threatening to hold him in contempt if he didn't produce the documentation publicly on this. And and my general sense is that didn't go over very well. Uh, in the J. Edgar Hoover building. Yeah, I can't imagine that. Okay, not to my, just my final thought on the Republican thing, because this is a good point, right? Like that this, had the Republicans not publicized this, we probably wouldn't be in this situation because FBI is happy to keep the stuff under wrap, right? Under wraps. Yeah. The FBI gets crazy, like accusations and leads all the time from like random, from people, yeah. from, from sources, right? Yep, and so yep. like the interesting thing is, and this is when you try to put this in the context of what is different about this, like what is notable, is that the Republicans' lack of willingness to, to show any restraint, right? And the, the, their desperation to have something that is true it is kind of how you end up here, right? Because in this other situation, you know, it's not as if past Congress, it's not as if Newt Gingrich in 1994 couldn't have found some like random whitewater accusation from some FBI source that wasn't fully vetted and put it out, right? It's not like Nancy Pelosi couldn't have done that during the Trump years or whatever. Like, like it, it is, it is, it shows just a total willingness to want to uh, uh, put forth the nicest thing you could say is unvetted information about this administration. Tim the, Tim, the other thing about this is, and, and we referenced it earlier, right? Um, and again, all this is sort of publicly available in terms of the in, in various investigations and also uh, journalism on this. Um, there's a lot of really unflattering information about Hunter Biden in the public domain, legitimately in the public yeah. domain, that raises real questions about his behavior. And there's real, you know, and there are entirely legitimate questions to be asked about what his family knew and when they knew it, right? Sure. Um, and, 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 you know, and those factors... You, you know, it's perfectly appropriate to have the merit in the context of an election. I don't think anyone, I certainly know that that the Times as, a, as an institution has been committed to sort of looking into these things and, and yeah. presenting the information as best as we can. We've covered, we've covered the Hunter Biden case 
uh, pretty thoroughly over the years. You know, we've been we've been engaged in every twist and turn on this. Um, but but you know the, the point here is like what's the quality of information that's being pumped out into the into the public domain and would we and you know because it is actually this is one of those rare instances where we can apply the standards we have as a news organization to the release of public information right right and and, and I've heard that term transparency and I think it is a really interesting conversation to have because I you know you hear politicians talk about transparency all the time and while that is very very clearly we are very much into transparency, right? But how you choose, but transparency isn't about making every single scrap of information that's scraped up from every single corner uh, instantly public without curation, right? And I think that's what we're seeing here is like, there's a big difference between transparency and sort of a responsible analysis of information. Yeah. This is yeah. right. And this is, I think, the fundamental. Like, you can imagine, and, and, and this kind of brings us full circle to the old Republican Party. Like, you can imagine a Mike Gallagher, an old type of Republican, running an oversight committee and doing a real investigation into Hunter Biden. And did Joe Biden know? Like, were there a couple right. times where Joe met with his, where his business partners where it may have been a little bit untoward and, and, and you know, subpoenaing people and taking that seriously? Like, you could imagine that oversight committee. And, and then what we have instead is this oversight committee, which is like, we're going to take what very well may be Russian disinformation that is comically false, like very easily provably false, right. that has right. been rejected by the FBI for three years. And we're going to turn it into the central part of an impeachment inquiry. And that's, I mean, right. that's very different. Look, look, and the other thing about this, and I just have to throw this out as a caveat, is yeah. while while we're seeing things in an indictment and while we're, we're hearing what the FBI uh, briefed members of Congress on, you know, there's always a possibility that you know, some piece of information is going to pop up that verifies some of these claims. You know, you know what I mean? And, and that's well, also part not of the this process. I mean, not the claim that Hunter Biden right. was in Ukraine and no, not no, the claim no, that Joe no. Biden has like a series no. of a web of bank accounts <laughs> that are no, so it's... secret that the CIA no, but... couldn't uncover it. But that was I mean, no, exa those exa no, exa exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But the challenge, you know, from, from reporters who are trying to cover this thing in a balanced way is like right. you, is like you've got e even while even while you're you're even while you're being hit with this fusillade of, of, of exaggerations and sort of politicizing data points and taking them out of context, which is what the feds are alleging, right? Um, it, it, you, you also got to keep an open mind as to where an investigation might lead. Sure. So, so, it may, so it actually makes it very hard for the journalists, you know, the quote unquote mainstream journalists who are trying to cover this responsibly because you're getting just, you know, how, you got to see my inbox, man. It's like... Right. <laughs> You know, it, it, it yeah. really is. And, and so what you actually have to do is kind of filter the filter out the noise about people's interpretation of data that comes into the public domain and just push that away and actually examine it in the context of what really. Yeah. Well, what like, really this happened. is like the Rudy thing. And this goes back to the laptop yeah. originally. I mean, they originally the Wall Street Journal was taking a serious look. They had real reporters looking into the laptop, but they get so bored with that, that they're just like, oh, we're just going to publish it. Like, we're just going to put it out, right. you know, through someone else. And, 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 you know, you could argue that, like, that was cutting off their nose despite their face, right? Like, it, it, it made it, it made it not incredible. Yeah. That, that's not, that's back to my old work. That's the oppo work. That's the thinking of, like, well, how do you actually disseminate information in a way that right. is credible, makes people feel credible? Okay, Glenn Thrush, man, I'm so happy to see you. Twice I've seen Good you now you. in the last two months. Yeah. I miss you. I appreciate miss your you work. Too. Stay on it. Um, I loved your article. People, we, we got into some of it. People should check out your article on the mysterious Alexander Smirnoff was in the Times this morning, and uh, we'll be in touch.